This is Randy Shell, and I'm making part two of a three-part series on cardiac subspecialty anesthesiology high-yield keyword review. It's part of our University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology didactic series. Let's first look at the cardiac keywords as a reminder what they are. They're published by the American Board of Anesthesia each year to all people who take exams as well as the programs. We went over these in part one and it's just a reminder of where the keywords come from. We take the ones from the last more than a decade, put them together, and that's what this presentation is built on. If you look at an outline of how I cover the cardiac keyword topics, the part one was over cardiac anatomy, cardiac physiology, and preoperative cardiac evaluation keywords. Well, part two will be over monitoring, heart failure physiology, electrolyte, dysrhythmias, and pacemakers. So let's go right into some monitoring keywords first. CVP waveform. The CVP waveform is shown at the top graphically, and you can see that with the P wave on the electrocardiogram, there is an A wave on the CVP. Now you think, well, wait a second, my CVP looks like just a flat line, but if you expanded it and looked very closely at it, you would see that after the P wave in someone uh, who's in sinus rhythm, they will have an A wave, a positive deflection on their CVP waveform. Another positive deflection is the C wave that occurs after the QRS complex. And the QRS complex results in the contraction of the ventricle, the tricuspid valve bulges back, and the C wave deflection occurs. And then from the QRS complex all the way to the end of the T wave is systole, so that's ejection of the heart. But in the atrial side, what is happening is there is filling occurring at the end of systole, and um, the uh, V wave is systolic filling of the atrium. So you have an A, C, and a V wave separated by X and Y descents. And basically, the A wave is what we're mainly going to focus in on in this keyword. If a patient is in atrial fibrillation, then they will not have an A wave. If you have AV dissociation, for example, uh, V pacing, where the heart is just ventricularly paced, the atria is merely going along, every once in a while the atria and the ventricle contract at the same time, and the pressure waveforms can hit and then deflect back up into the uh, SVC where your catheter is and make a huge A wave. And that's shown at the bottom right graphic with the little red star showing a giant A wave which can occur with AV dissociation of any cause. Junctional rhythm, ventricular pacing, heart block, all causes of a giant A wave. Now high CVP can occur in situations like cardiac tamponade, if you're using really high levels of PEEP, like 10, 15, 20. If the heart on the right side is ischemic, the right side is failing, CVP goes up, and classically with, uh, with hypervolemia. Tamponade, if you're monitoring CVP in a patient who has cardiac tamponade, think of the heart having a big bag of fluid around it, such that during diastole, when it's not contracting, all the pressures uh, in the heart equalize, all the chambers of the heart, the atria and the ventricle are exposed to the pressure inside that sac. So all of the diastolic pressures equalize the CVP, the pulmonary diastolic pressure, and the wedge pressure. So if you see a patient who's got a CVP of, let's say 21, a PAD of 20, and a wedge pressure of 22, you say, wow, that's all almost similar. That's consistent with tamponade physiology, equalization of diastolic pressures. And then there are others that are shown on the right uh, that uh, CVP waveform changes can be used uh, in sophisticated uh, users to help diagnose things like tricuspid stenosis and uh, constrictive pericarditis, etc. Fluid responsiveness, stroke volume response to fluid loading. The dynamic parameters, such as stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation, are superior to static measurements to try to determine what's going to happen if you give a patient fluid. And what I mean by that is CVP, just one static pressure, is not a good reflection or predictor of what's going to happen if you give that patient fluid. One of the things that you can do, as represented at the top right graphic, is a passive leg lift. 
If you raise the legs, it's like auto transfusion of fluid into the patient. Stroke volume and blood pressure changes then can be followed with that self-volume load and see what happens. Pulse pressure variation and stroke volume vari variation are the next graphic shown on the far right. And when a patient is being mechanically ventilated at a tidal volume of at least 8 mils per kilogram and is not breathing spontaneously, the conditions exist where the heart-lung interactions can be used to try to determine what's going to happen if you give them fluid. So these are very special situations. You can't do it with an open chest per se, like a thoracotomy. But if the chest is closed, mechanically ventilated, 8 per kilo tidal volume, paralyzed, not breathing on their own, pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation uh, can be utilized as a way to estimate a response to fluids. So in the graphic on the far right, you can see that under these specific situations, if inspiration occurs, positive pressure ventilation, inspiration, the interthoracic vessels are compressed and it's like squeezing a sponge and squeezing the fluid out of them and the left ventricle sees that extra fluid. So during inspiration, positive pressure ventilation, you see an increase in stroke volume. And then during expiration, it decreases. And the difference between these two, if it's widely divergent, between inspiration and expiration, you say, aha, that's a big stroke volume variation and will likely respond to fluids. Uh, pulse pressure variation, same idea. As the intrathoracic pressure rises from positive pressure ventilation, it squeezes the vessels in the chest, initially gives more blood to the left ventricle, uh, the pulse pressure uh, goes up, the higher pressure that is, and the pulse pressure uh, minimum goes down during expiration. And if there's a wide divergence between those two, inspiration and expiration are having a great effect on pulse pressure, you say, aha, that pro patient's probably hypovolemic. One of the things you may have recognized during trauma patients is if you follow your A-line and a patient who is hypovolemic receiving positive pressure ventilation, you can often see wide variations in blood pressure uh, with mechanical respiration. The A-line trace is up and then down during uh, respirations and you say that patient is hypovolemic and needs probably blood. IVC can also be used. Uh, the IVC size, if the IVC size in general is very big and distended and more than two centimeters and it doesn't change with respiration, we suggest, we say that that's probably a very high CVP in the patient's hypervolemic. Uh, if the IVC is very small and it changes a lot with respiration, we say that that patient is probably hypovolemic or could use some fluids. So fluid responsiveness and using dynamic parameters is probably better than static parameters like a single measurement like CVP. Now some hemodynamic parameters and we're going to go over this graphic. MAP or mean arterial pressure is basically two-thirds diastolic uh, plus one-third systolic pressure. We spend most of our time in diastole. And MAP should be in the range of about 70 to 110 millimeters of mercury. We call that pulse pressure, the difference between systolic minus diastolic blood pressure. A patient with a wide pulse pressure, an example would be someone with severe aortic insufficiency. Mean pulmonary artery pressure uh, is uh, uh, the blood pressure in the pulmonary artery driving it through the system minus the, uh, the pressure on the opposite side, which is the wedge pressure, wedge pressure uh, divided by the cardiac output, which we're going to show in uh, just a little a bit here, how to calculate that is pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, mean pulmonary artery pressure itself is as represented here and normally is about 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury, obviously much lower than the mean arterial pressure, and we say that a mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than about 25 at rest is significant pulmonary hypertension. CVP waveforms, we said that there's positive deflections of an A wave from the atrial contraction, a C wave from the tricuspid valve bulging up into the atrium, and a V wave from atrial filling during the end of systole, and that normal CVP as approximately 0 to 10 millimeters of mercury, but it doesn't reflect volume status as well as some of the dynamic parameters that we talked about in the previous slide. CVP tends to be high with a failing left and right ventricle, valvular heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, or very fast heart rates where runoff of blood
uh, there's not enough time in diastole for the blood to fully run off and the CVP can rise just based upon tachycardia. The wedge pressure uh, we take from the, uh, the tip of the pulmonary artery catheter that's often sitting in the right pulmonary artery, blow up the balloon on it, and we hope we have a manometric uh, uh, fluid column that goes all the way from the tip of that pulmonary artery catheter, past the alveolar capillaries, past the uh, pulmonary veins, into the left atrium, across the mitral valve, and then measuring pressures on the left side of the heart. And therefore you can see there's a lot of things in between that right pulmonary artery, where your tip of your PA catheter often is, and the balloon is blown up, and the pressures that are on the left side of the heart. But the attempt is to uh, use wedge pressure as a reflection of the pressure inside the heart during diastole, or LVEDP. Let's look at one of the key words uh, on the topic of monitoring, SVR and PVR calculations, or systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance calculations. The graphic here that I've drawn represents flow, pressure, and resistance in a tube, flow being Q, dependent upon the difference in pressure between P1 at the start of that tube and P2 at the, P2 at the other end of that tube and the resistance inside the tube. And Flow is proportional to the change in pressure, P1 minus P2. Obviously, if P1 is very high and P2 is very low, there's more driving pressure through that tube, divided by the resistance. The higher the resistance, the less the flow. The less the resistance, the more the flow. Now, we can rearrange this equation of Q equals delta P over R to solve for R. And uh, if we pull R up and move it to the left side and pull Q over and move it at the bottom, you then have resistance is equal to a change in pressure over a flow. And so when we calculate systemic vascular resistance, it's a change in pressure, which is the driving pressure through the systemic circulation, which is MAP, that's P1. P2 is the CVP when the pressure inside the right atrium, when fluid's coming back through the tube to the of the body over a flow, which is cardiac output, and then we times it by 80 to convert it uh, from wood units to uh, dynes seconds centimeters to the minus fifth. PVR is, again, a change in pressure, but in this case, it's the mean pulmonary artery pressure driving blood through the pulmonary artery, and the pressure on the opposite side is the wedge pressure of the heart, so that's P2, over Q, which is cardiac output again, times 80, converts it from wood units to, again, dynes second centimeter to the minus fifth. And normally, our PVR is way much less than the SVR, about an eighth of it or so. And when we think of wood units, uh, before we times it by 80, uh, usually that value is in the range of about 0.3 to 1.6. And when you talk with uh, congenital heart disease cardiologists, pediatric cardiologists, Often they'll talk about wood units, the resistance in the peripheral vasc in the pulmonary vasculature that is of, of patients with congenital heart disease. Some general cardiac calculations. Cardiac output, by definition, it's stroke volume, how much goes out with each beat, times heart rate, and it's about three to eight liters per minute. Stroke volume normally being about 60 to 100 mils, determined by how full it is, preload, how much work it's working against after load and how contractile it is. Cardiac index takes that cardiac output and divides it by body surface area to index it to how big the person is. And we normally say that that should be somewhere greater than 2.5. And when it's down in the 2 to 2.2 range, liters per meter squared, we say that is not good. That's low. That's an indicator of heart failure or poor cardiac output. Ejection fraction is the difference between and diastolic volume, how full the heart is when it's as full as it can be, minus after it contracts, and systole, which is stroke volume by definition, over end diastolic volume, and as a percentage, it should be greater than 55%. When we say it's less than 40%, we say that's a bad heart. SVR we already talked about, and it's a measure of afterload. P1, mean arterial pressure, minus P2, CVP, over flow, cardiac output, times 80 for the correction gives you that 800 to 1600 unit uh, as SVR normal. Content is what is bound to hemoglobin plus what is dissolved in the blood. 
And what is bound to Hebelum by far makes up the greatest component of our content. 1.34 mils of oxygen for each gram of hemoglobin per deciliter. And 0.003 times the PaO2 gives us how much is dissolved. And normally we think about 20 mils of oxygen per deciliter or 200 mils per liter as oxygen content. Delivery of oxygen is how much blood is going to the tissues plus how much oxygen is in that blood that's going to the tissues. And if you had 200 mils of oxygen for each liter, which we just said was content, times a five liter cardiac output, normal cardiac output, five times 200 is 1,000. Therefore, you get that classic DO2 of 1,000 mils per minute oxygen delivery. Now, in our tissues, one metabolic equivalent is equivalent to about 250 mils of oxygen a minute that we're consuming. And that means that we're only consuming about a fourth of the oxygen that's being delivered. And so when blood comes back to the pulmonary artery, it characteristically has a saturation of about 75%. There's many things that can uh, affect oxygen usage and mixed venous oxygen, and we're going to go over those in further slides. In fact, uh, mixed venous oxygen, we said the range normally is above about 70% and a P little AO2 of about 40. Uh, and that's the measurement of saturation of oxygen in the pulmonary artery, the mixed venous. And uh, coronary perfusion pressure in part one, we said it was diastolic pressure minus LVEDP, and it should be about 60 or more. And we calculated PVR uh, when we were comparing SVR and PVR calculations, P1 being mean pulmonary artery pressure, minus P2, which is the uh, uh, occlusion pressure, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or wedge pressure, overflow cardiac output times that 80 gives us our pulmonary vascular resistance estimate. And it's normally about an eighth to a tenth of the systemic vascular resistance. Things that increase pulmonary vascular resistance are bad things like hypoxia and hypercarbia and hypothermia and acidosis and norepinephrine um, and other vasoconstrictors that affect the alpha-1 re, uh, receptor. So PBR, if it goes up dramatically, the right heart may not like that and may not be able to beat against that high resistance and fail. So we use some things occasionally to decrease pulmonary vascular resistance, and that could be inhaled nitric oxide, which we're going to have a discussion of that as a keyword, Vasodilators like nitroglycerin or nitroprusside, which are cyclic GMP-mediated vasodilation, but not just limited to the pulmonary vasculature. They are also systemic uh, vasodilators. And phosphodiesterase inhibitors like milrinone, which we give intravenously, and some patients who are on sildenafil um, for uh, pulmonary hypertension. Next topic is myocardial ischemia detection. How do we detect it intraoperatively? Well, physiologically, the very first thing that occurs in the heart when you have ischemia is there's problems with relaxation, diastolic relaxation. Well, we're not going to detect that usually. So the first thing that we often detect if we're monitoring with a continuous echo is suddenly a wall stops moving. Remember, the LAD supplies the anterior wall, the circumflex supplies the lateral wall, and in general, the right coronary supplies the inferior wall. Um, and these wall motion abnormalities can correlate then where they're occurring with which coronary artery is involved. After the wall motion, systolic function changes, regional wall motion changes, then the electrocardiographic changes occur, and then the hemodynamic changes. From an EKG aspect, if we see ST segment elevation, uh, we say, wow, that's really bad. If it was in the lateral leads, we'd say that's a circumflex coronary artery. There's ST segment elevation. It's acute. We better get them to the cath lab. Well, in general, we think of ST segment depression as supply-demand issues and do everything we can to increase supply and decrease demand. And if the heart rate's fast, a beta blocker like Esmol is a wise thing. If the heart rate is not um, uh, fast and preload is up and pressures are up in the heart, nitroglycerin may be a good choice also. So we have options to treat myocardial ischemia. The most sensitive indicator for detecting myocardial ischemia is TE, specifically those wall motion abnormalities. The pulmonary artery catheter is, is not sensitive. Now, if someone had uh, ischemia and developed acute mitral regurgitation because their papillary muscles are ischemic, mitral valves not coapting well, um, you could see V waves. But in general, the PA catheter is not something that is useful to detect myocardial ischemia. Uh, 
We know that leads two and V5, which we characteristically monitor together, lead two to look at dysrhythmias because we can see the P wave so well in lead two in V5 because it detects a large amount of left ventricular ischemia. And in fact, if you combine those two together, you can detect almost 90% of ischemic episodes. What is important to realize though is that when myocardial ischemia occurs interoperably, many times it's just silent, meaning you don't know what's happening. There's not blood pressure changes or heart rate changes, and uh, um, it's often difficult to detect. And nowadays, some are using troponin leaks uh, as a measure, even in patients who are asymptomatic but are at high risk surgery for detecting uh, intraoperative myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction that's occurring. Here's a question for you. Immediately post coronary bypass graft surgery, a patient with a normal preoperative cardiac function arrives in the ICU. Their blood pressure is 108 over 62. Their heart rate's 85. Their cardiac index is 3.4. The hemoglobin is 9.2. Their wedge pressure is 14. Saturation is good at 99%. And their mixed venous is 51%. Remember we said the mixed venous normal is about 70-75%. The most likely etiology of this low mixed venous is decreased oxygen content, high cardiac output, increased oxygen demand, early sepsis, and the answer is increased oxygen demand. This is classic. A patient arrives whose neuromuscular blockade and uh, anesthetics are wearing off. They begin to shiver and are using more oxygen and the saturation uh, drops of the mixed venous. So let's look at mixed venous oxygenization as our next topic. It's a global measure of oxygenization and it's taken from the distal tip of the pulmonary artery catheter out in the pulmonary artery. So it's all the blood coming back to the heart, desaturated, we're taking a sample of that and it's a measure of global tissue uh, oxygenization. The normal being about that 70% or so and a PVO2 being about 40 millimeters of mercury. And things that affect it include how much blood flow is going to the tissue, cardiac output, how much oxygen the tissue is using, which is VO2, and how much content or oxygen is present in the blood that is going to the tissues. So let's look at some things that can increase or decrease mixed venous. Increase first, so above that 70% range or so. Well, if you're not using the oxygen that's coming to the tissues, it's just going to go around and come back and give you a high mixed venous. Cyanide toxicity, where cyanide paralyzes, poisons the cytochrome AA3 oxidase system. You don't use the oxygen, even though the tissues undergo anaerobic metabolism and lactate's being produced and acid's being produced. The oxygen just comes to the tissues, goes around, and comes right back to the central circulation, and you have a high mixed venous. Cold. Uh, hypothermia reduces VO2 or oxygen use by the tissues and your mixed venous can go up dramatically. Increased mixed venous above that 70% but with a high cardiac output as the cause. Uh, one of the classic ones is a shunt. If you have a large left or right shunt where blood bypasses tissues and just comes right back to the pulmonary system with the oxygen still in it, well that can be a high cardiac output with an increased mixed venous. Sepsis is another example. The cirrhotic patient is a classic one. If you do liver transplants ever, you'll notice that hemodynamically, they often have a blood pressure that's quite low, 90 to 100. They're very vasodilated, low systemic vascular resistance. The cardiac index, if they have a good heart, is like really high. So high cardiac output, low vascular resistance. They have these shunts, hepatopulmonary and other shunts that are occurring that blood is bypassing tissues and coming right back and their mixed venous is sometimes like 90% or more. So high cardiac output and shunts a cause for increased SVO2. Things that decrease mixed venous below 70%. Well if you're anemic, if you're using oxygen at a high rate like if you have a fever or you're shivering or if you're not delivered the amount of oxygen that you should have with a bad lungs for example, hypoxia, ARDS, it's a problem with the lungs themselves or low cardiac output patient who has congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, or severely hypovolemic. Normally we think of first looking at hemoglobin and cardiac output uh, and then focusing in on oxygen use when we have a low mixed venous, which we're going to go over the management in the next slide. But let's first look at the graphic to the far right, which shows the oxygen content, the saturation, and uh, blood leaving the heart the oxygen content 
is normally, as we said, somewhere around about 20 mils of oxygen per deciliter. And normal saturation, uh, SpO2 or SaO2, is about 95 to 98%. And normal hemoglobin, 13 to 15 grams per deciliter. Cardiac output, normal, 4 to 8 liters per minute going out. And DO2 would be the combination of cardiac output times the content. And we said that if cardiac output was 5, and the content was 200 mils of oxygen for each uh, liter. Five times 200 is about that thousand mils a minute DO2. And we said that VO2 is about 250 mils a minute if it were at one met or just met one metabolic equivalent, doing nothing. Um, remember that four metabolic equivalents is like climbing two flights of stairs or so. So blood comes back to the heart with a lot of oxygen still in it, and therefore the mixed venous is in that range of about 70%. What do you do if you have a low mixed venous? Well, resuscitate the blood pressure. Try to get it up above 65. And if your SpO2 is reading below that 70% range, look at first, what is your SaO2? Is, there, is it a problem with your lungs? Uh, do you need to add PEEP? Is it ARDS or something like that? Up their oxygen. Um, but let's assume that your mixed venous is less than 70%, but your saturation's above 95%. Then look at your cardiac output. If your cardiac output is high, more than 2.5 liters per minute per meter squared, your cardiac index, then you say, well, it's not a problem with output. It's not a problem with the lungs and the oxygen that's in it. Maybe it's a problem with the content. Um, and check your hemoglobin, and if your hemoglobin is low, blood transfusion would be indicated. If your hemoglobin is greater than 8, you say, well, you're delivering oxygen. The content's okay. They must be using a lot of oxygen. And in that case, neuromuscular blockade, analgesia, sedation may be indicated. Now let's go back up to cardiac output. And instead of it being high, it being low, less than 2.5 liters per minute per meter squared cardiac index. And then we say, okay, if the cardiac output's low, is it a problem? Is it not full? Or is the muscle not contracting well? And so we can use the wedge and separate it out into a low wedge, hypovolemia, give them a fluid challenge, or a high wedge where we say, whoa, that's a heart that is full, not producing a good cardiac output. We can't just keep adding fluids to it. We better add an inotrope like dobutamine, which has beta-1 and beta-2 effects. And that's the beta-1 effect that we're taking advantage of to increase contractility. What's the difference between systolic versus diastolic dysfunction is the next key word. Systolic dysfunction, by definition, is where we have a decreased cardiac output unable to meet demands. Characteristically, there's a low mixed venous because there's not enough oxygen going to the tissues. Tissues continue to use oxygen. They extract more from it, and so it doesn't come back at 70%. It might come back at 50%. If they have a low ejection fraction, less than 40%, with regional wall motion abnormalities, let's say the lateral wall is not moving, or the anterior wall is not moving, or they have a very high filling pressures in the heart, greater than 18 millimeters of mercury is the usual criteria that we use. In those cases, those patients are often on diuretics, ACE inhibitors, and often in the acute situation, they may be on inotropes and vasopressors. Diastolic dysfunction is where the heart doesn't relax well, it's not compliant, it's stiff. And that's classically in the old patient who has had long-standing hypertension with a big, thick left ventricle. And during diastole, the pressures are high in the heart. So the LVDP is high, just like it was high during uh, systolic dysfunction. But if you look at on echo, their ejection fraction, in a patient, for example, who has heart failure related to diastolic dysfunction, their EF is normal. You say, well, why are they in heart failure? Their EF is 60%. And then you think about it and say, aha, it, this hypertensive elderly patient has a stiff left ventricle. And during diastole, the high pressures inside back up through the mitral valve into the pulmonary system, and the hydrostatic pulmonary edema is occurring. That's why they have pulmonary edema, not because their EF is way less than 60%, it's because the diastolic relaxation issue and stiff left ventricle and high pressures. They're often aggressively treated for their hypertension in an attempt to reduce the increased stiffness that can occur over time of these patients with 
beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. But in general, there's not good long-term uh, decreases in mortality related to treatment with beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. There was a uh, ITE keyword based around contraindications to ACE inhibitors, so I'll bring that in here. The absolute contraindication is if someone has previous angioedema with ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors uh, not only reduce the uh, production of angiotensin II, but also bradykinin, um, the uh, breakdown of uh, bradykinin. So bradykinin builds up, and it can cause angioedema. Uh, so if someone has had angioedema, swelling of the airway, for example, after introduction of an ACE inhibitor, you're definitely not going to give it to them again. If they have renal artery stenosis and you're dropping the pressure down there in the kidney, you could uh, kill off more of their kidney in pregnancy. The teratogenicity associated with it is an indi uh, absolute indication. Relative contraindications is cases where you don't want to drop the vascular resistance, like someone with severe aortic stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So systolic versus diastolic dysfunction, let's look at that graphically with LV pressure volume curves and pictorially at the top. Pictorially, you can see that big, thick left ventricle, LV hypertrophy, that's going to be stiff, like that weightlifter who can barely move around because they're just muscle bound. While the systolic dysfunction heart is that thinned out, big heart, uh, lots of volume inside of it that's just not contracting well, the EF of 15 and 20 percent. And if you look at pressure volume curves uh, at the bottom left first of the diastolic dysfunction patient, you can see that the uh, diastolic dysfunction patient has a relatively low volume inside, um, but what is characteristic is where that little blue arrow is showing the LVEDP. That's when the heart is full, 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 just before it contracts and creates isovolumetric contraction, increasing the pressure before ejection. So that point is the left ventricular end diastolic volume on the x-axis, and then if you trace it over to the y-axis, that point is the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, and it's high, uh, stiff ventricle. As opposed to the systolic dysfunction patient pressure volume curve, you can see that, wow, the volume inside this heart is huge. That's like the dilated, failing left ventricle, and you can also see that the width of the curve is narrow. And from previous part one discussion, you hopefully remember that the difference between the end diastolic volume, where I'm pointing now at the bottom right of this curve, and the end systolic volume, the difference between these two, or the width of this, tells us about stroke volume. So this is a narrow, low stroke volume, low ejection fraction, with, again, the LVDP is very high. So that's a systolic dysfunction patient on the far right. Effective lusotropic agents, or agents that help relax the heart, lusotropy uh, is a measure of relaxation, on the pressure volume curve. And this was one of the key words. Lusotropes are drugs like beta adrenergic agonists and milrinone, for example, and negative lusotropes are things that make it stiffer, are high calcium levels and ischemia. And the way that you would pick this out on a pressure volume curve would be if you had on the far bottom right where the big uh, red star is, the, a graph that was a pressure volume curve, and you looked at, at the same volume, you went up to that curve and then over to the pressure on the y-axis, if at the same volume there was a higher pressure inside the heart, that means that that's a less of a compliant heart. Um, if you have a balloon that you can blow up a lot, and the pressure doesn't blow, uh, get high in it, that's a compliant balloon, as opposed to one that if you put just a little bit of volume in it, the pressure gets high. That's not compliant. So if you're at the same volume, but the pressure's higher, in general, that's decreased lusotropy. So ischemia could cause decreased lusotropy, such that the same volume results in a higher pressure within the heart. Which of the following would be the most useful to determine uh, that heart failure in a patient is caused by diastolic dysfunction rather than systolic dysfunction. Well, both have a high LVDP. Blood pressure uh, has a lot of things that could uh, be affecting that. Uh, mixed venous oxygenization, um, maybe, although um, if you had adequate uh, cardiac output, even though they had systolic dysfunction, um, you know, you, you might not have a drop in mixed venous oxygenization. And then ejection fraction. Well, 
the diastolic dysfunction uh, patient in general has a preserved ejection fraction, while the systolic dysfunction uh, patient has a low ejection fraction. Congestive heart failure. Next topic. Risk for LV failure, um, poor heart function, low ejection fraction, puts a patient at risk for congestive heart failure. And by definition, what is a low ejection fraction? Less than 40%. Uh, what are pressures in the heart that indicate that there's high pressures? And uh, one of the indicators of a poor heart, high wedge pressure, greater than 18. What about how much it's putting out, the cardiac index? Less than two liters per minute per meter squared um, is some of the indicators to say that this is a bad left ventricle. And if it has a wall that's not moving, the lateral wall, the anterior wall, the inferior wall, or some combination of that, we say that's another indicator of decreased LV function. In general, a patient with congestive heart failure uh, can have a low cardiac output. They can have a low blood pressure. Fluid is building up in the lungs because pressure is backing up. Um, the tissues continue to need oxygen and, and use oxygen, but they're not getting much cardiac output. So metabolic acidosis ensues. The body says, I must retain fluid to try to make that heart beat better and stronger. So sodium retention occurs, tachycardia occurs, vasoconstriction occurs, trying to keep the blood pressure up, which then this failing heart gets even worse because now it's beating against a high resistance. So you can see why congestive heart failure um, pathophysiology makes things worse and worse and worse over time and we attempt to reduce uh, afterload with ACE inhibitors for example uh, to uh, decrease the progression of congestive heart failure. The response to preload in someone with a good heart versus a poor systolic function is shown on the right and in blue represents a poor systolic function uh, Frank Starling curve and from point A to B at the bottom, you can see a volume challenge given. And if you give a volume challenge to someone with poor systolic function, you get very little, if any, increase in stroke volume. In fact, you could get a decrease if you went over the Frank Starling curve. You were giving way too much fluids. So very little change in stroke volume to that poor systolic function patient. As opposed to the green example here, same volume challenge, A to B, same amount of volume given, but notice the stroke volume increase that occurs in a normal systolic function patient. A gap in knowledge from several years ago that if you give a beta blocker to someone who has an increased left ventricular end diastolic volume, it's a failing heart and you beta block it even more acutely, uh, you can increase LV EDV in that patient. CHF and Frank Starling curves continue on this discussion, uh, and two drugs contrasted, milrinone and phenylephrine. Milrinone increases the inotropic state of the heart. It's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, uh, decreases the breakdown of intracellular cyclic AMP, raising calcium inside the myocardial cell. It contracts more. It's also a, uh, a lucitrope. It helps the heart relax, but it also decreases systemic vascular resistance. And if you bolus melanoma, you can see that vasodilation and often hypotension ensues. So melanoma by definition is an inodilator, positive inotrope and vasodilator. And it drops pulmonary vascular resistance, it drops wedge pressure, drops systemic vascular resistance. So these are good for a failing heart. It increases the contractility of the heart and reduces the resistance that it's beating against. Good thing to do. Phenylephrine, uh, however, increases the systemic vascular resistance and also contracts the venules and the veins of the body such that preload goes up. So if you have a failing heart and the blood pressure is dropping, you're in the operating room, didn't realize the EF was 20% in the patient. For some reason it wasn't known and the patient's hypotensive, you gave him phenylephrine, you may uh, make that heart fail even more because the vascular resistance goes up the preload goes up and it's already on the high end of its Frank Starling curve. And this graphically is shown on the bottom where you have normal uh, being the blue curve. And in the green curve, if you add inotropy or reduce afterload for the same pressure in the heart, you get more stroke volume. And in the failing heart, purplish colored uh, graph on the bottom, this is basically showing decreased inotropy or more resistance to beat against, increased afterload.
So by dropping afterload and increasing inotropy, we can shift this curve up and to the left and reduce dinotropy and increased afterload can make it shift down and to the right. The next topic is ACE inhibitors and uh, ARBs or angiotensin receptor blockers which are often used in patients with heart failure. And the first graphic shows angiotensinogen produced by our liver uh, acted on by renin, a enzyme from our kidney, which produces angiotensin 1. The angiotensin 1 goes to our lung where the ACE enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, is present which in uh, an unblocked state results in angiotensin II production, which uh, causes vasoconstriction and uh, production of aldosterone with reabsorption of water and sodium. Now, if you give that person an ACE inhibitor and block the ACE enzyme, angiotensin I to angiotensin II in the lung is blocked. But you also block the breakdown of bradykinins and uh, these bradykinins are associated with part of the hypotensive effect of ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors reduce angiotensin production, but they also uh, have more bradykinins sitting around, several mechanisms for its hypotensive effect. Now, if you look at ACE versus ARBs, the ACE inhibitors are affecting the uh, uh, conversion of angiotensin to uh, 1 to 2 and uh, the breakdown of bradykinin while ARBs are way down the line at the angiotensin receptor itself. They're not affecting bradykinins. Um, so if we hold ACE inhibitors before surgery, which many people do because of the worry about the hypotension in the perioperative period that could ensue, um, if a patient actually took the ACE inhibitor and was hypotensive, Vasopressin uh, seems to be uniquely helpful in that situation. Patients can get cough and angioedema, a side effect in ACE inhibitors, and this is attributed to the bradykinin uh, inhibiting its breakdown. So ARBs not having the cough and angioedema necessarily associated with them. We mentioned some of the contraindications already of ACE inhibitors being renal artery stenosis, previous history of angioedema swelling up of the airway in someone who just got started on an ACE inhibitor. Um, uh, we would not give them uh, further ACE inhibitors. Digitalis, next keyword, and how does it work? It works in the heart by inhibiting sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, um, and if it inhibits, as shown graphically on the far right, the sodium potassium ATPase, that one is normally keeping sodium and potassium on the uh, proper sides of the uh, cell. So it is pumping sodium out and uh, uh, potassium in normally. So if we block that, there's a lot more sodium that goes up inside the uh, cardiac myocyte. And then the sodium calcium exchanger takes over and moves sodium out, but in exchange it moves calcium in. And if you have calcium increase inside the cell, there is increased inotropy. So digitalis works via sodium potassium ATPase and the final mechanism is an increased calcium level inside the cell. We use digitalis uh, sometimes for AFib and trying to control the ventricular rate because it blocks the AV node. And rarely is it used anymore for its, quotes, inotropic effect. There's problems with DIG. It has a low therapeutic index. And if someone comes in DIG toxic and has electrocardiographic changes and the DIG level's up, one of the first things that you should do is obviously stop the digoxin. The second thing is fix a coexisting hypokalemia if it occurs. Give them potassium. There is a antibody that can bind digoxin, digibine, and there's other treatments like magnesium and dilantin. One of the problems with digoxin toxicity, if they go into a rhythm that needs to be shocked, you should shock them at a very low um, delivery of uh, energy because higher delivery of energy has been associated with conversion into very malignant dysrhythmias. Some cardiovascular effects of inhaled anesthetics. What does our sevoforin, isoforin, and desforin do to the heart? Mainly vasodilator, decreases systemic vascular resistance. Now the exception is halothane, but that's historically, so we're gonna focus just in on our modern inhaled anesthetics, which are vasodilators of the blood vessels. So blood pressure drops, 
at equal MAC concentrations of each of the volatile anesthetics such that you will not be able to tell the difference between the blood pressure effect of 2 MAC of isoflurane, 2 MAC of sevoflurane, or 2 MAC of desflurane. Cardiac output is maintained because heart rate uh, reflexively increases. And in an isolated muscle system where you don't have innervation of the heart, the inhaled anesthetics are actually decreased contractility. But overall, in an intact human patient, the uh, cardiac output is maintained with uh, sevoflurane, desflurane, and isoflurane. What are some electrocardiographic changes with electrolytes? Hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia, the first ones. What does calcium do to the EKG at the far right? You can see a graphic representation that the QT interval is what we should look at when you have calcium changes. When you're hypocalcemic, the QT interval increases. Normally, we say that a QT interval greater than about 440 milliseconds in a male, 450 in a female, there's some variations in that, but approximately that is considered longer than that long QT interval. So if the QT increases after you gave large doses of FFP or packed red blood cells in a very rapid succession, remember that citrate is not only in packed cells but in FFP. And if you give that rapidly, the citrate can bind the calcium that's present in this patient and drop the calcium level and QT interval goes up. So what can decrease the QT interval? Hypercalcemia and hyperparathyroidism or administration uh, iatrogenically of large amounts of calcium could shorten the QT interval. Potassium levels, we think of hyperkalemia being associated initially with peak T waves followed by some malignant dysrhythmias. Succinylcholine would be an example where in some patients who you shouldn't have given it to, like upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, and burn patients, give sucks. You could see the peak T wave, and if the potassium went high enough, uh, ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia could occur. Hypokalemia results in a smaller T wave and starting a formation of a U wave. So high T wave with hyperkalemia, low T wave with hypokalemia, and then hypermagnesemia decreases conduction and the intervals of many parts of our EKG are increased. Our PR interval, our widening of our QRS, interventricular, uh, interventricular conduction delay, and even asystole can occur with hypermagnesemia. Now, when would you be given lots of magnesium? OB anesthesia would be one example. Um, a magnesium overdose and calcium would be the antidote for that. Amiodarone, since we're getting into some dysrhythmias now, um, amiodarone can be used for both supraventricular, neurocomplex supraventricular, um, including Wolf, Wolf Parkinson White, as well as ventricular uh, tachy dysrhythmias. So it is a be-all, end-all for most dysrhythmias. Um, in a contraindication, a relative contraindication for amiodarone, however, is the fact that it prolongs the QT interval and somewhat torsades, we would avoid amiodarone. Amiodarone can be used for VTAC, VFib that's resistant to defibrillation. You have shock, shock, shock. Giving a drug, if they're arrested, you give 300 milligrams IV rapid bolus. If they have a perfusing rhythm, we give a lower dose, 150 milligrams IV over a shorter period, of, or over a longer period of time, that is, over 10 minutes, and often start a maintenance infusion afterwards. Now, there's some adverse effects of amiodarone. One, it vasodilates. Two, it prolongs the QT interval. And three, in people who are taking it chronically can get lung, thyroid, and eye issues. The lung being pulmonary fibrosis, the eye being microdeposits in their cornea, and with the thyroid, it can be both hypo or hyperthyroidism. Uh, amiodarone has iodine in it. So lung, eye, and thyroid with uh, amiodarone uh, long-term use. Treatment of perioperative SVT, the EKG at the top right shows a narrow complex, very rapid rate, uh, and that is SVT. You've lost the P wave, you have that fa fast ventricular response, but don't forget that even though SVT, we normally think of it as a narrow complex dysrhythmia, if someone had a pre-existing bundle branch block, let's say right bundle branch block, and then they went into an SVT, their bundle branch block is not gonna suddenly go away, it's just that now they will have a fast rate with a wide complex, and then you have to start thinking, is this 
SVT with aberrancy, that pre-existing bundle branch block, or is this VTAC? And there's uh, things that we utilize to try to make that differential. If the patient has perioperative SVT and is unstable, like almost every dysrhythmia, if hemodynamically state instability is present, blood pressure is very low, synchronized cardioversion, synchronized to the QRS complex. If they're hemodynamically stable and they don't have a known uh, abnormal accessory conduction pathway like Wolf Parkinson White, where they have an accessory pathway, then you get at the AV node with beta blockers like Esmol, calcium channel blockers like diltiazem. If atrial fibrillation develops perioperatively and you get a fast ventricular rate, we try to control the worry usually with beta blockers like Esmol. Uh, amiodarone can sometimes convert AFib back to sinus rhythm uh, in a chemical manner. But you also know that if AFib has been going on for an extended period of time, that in the atria is sitting there just wiggling and not contracting, the blood can stagnate in there and form a clot. And if you suddenly convert AFib into sinus rhythm and the atria contracts, that clot could go through the mitral valve, out the aorta, and potentially to the head and cause a stroke. So if AFib greater than 48 hours, or if you don't know how long it's been going on, uh, you need to worry about that clot and possibly anticoagulate or look on TE in the atrial appendage to see if there's a thrombus present. Remember that if you have SVT and fast ventricular rate, we think, okay, we need to slow conduction through the AV node. Um, but there's a situation, Wolf, Parkinson, White, where they have an accessory pathway where we need to get at the accessory pathway itself with drugs like procainamide or amiodarone. So that's one exception. Um, we should not use calcium channel blockers when we're treating dysrhythmias that may occur in combination with dantrolene. So here would be this rare, extremely rare situation. You have an MH episode. You're treating the MH. During the MH episode, they get a uh, atrial dysrhythmia like atrial fibrillation, and you want to slow their ventricular response. Combining dantrolene with Diltiazem, for example, can result in arrest uh, and hyperkalemia and arrest, and it should be avoided combining those two together. If you have wide complex QRS and you're not sure if this is VTAC or SVT with that pre existing bundle branch block and aberrancy, treat it like VTAC until you're for sure it's SVT with aberrancy. So, pulseless VTAC is the next key word. And our ACLS uh, algorithms are constantly changing, it seems, but this is the ACLS algorithm on the far right. Call for help, start CPR, give oxygen, attach your monitor and your defibrillator. Is it a shockable rhythm? And if you have a shockable rhythm and it's pulseless, um, you're going to shock that patient and you're going to start CPR. Um, now, let's assume that the uh, shocking uh, you want to make it is chance that you're successful as good as possible and there's some factors that affect your ability to defibrillate a patient. One is the larger the pad size and the better the gel contact the better you're going to get deliver energy to that heart. Most defibrillators now are biphasic deliverers of electrical energy rather than monophasic and that's why we've changed from 360 joules as the highest recommendation down to like 200 joules in the biphasic waveform uh, type of delivery. Transthoracic impedance, the impedance for electricity to go from where you're delivering it through the heart itself. If you have uh, inspiration, there's air in the way. If you have a pneumothorax, there's air in the way. In fact, I've had a case where until I inflated the chest and got rid of a pneumothorax that was present, uh, we could not defibrillate a patient well. And the more shocks you give, uh, shock, shock, that th second and third shock have less impedance and more gets through to the heart and uh, correct the hypoxia and electrolyte disorders that may be present and you may be able to defibrillate easier. Note that uh, vasopressin is gone uh, from this new algorithm that if you shock, shock, shocked and were unsuccessful, you would give uh, epinephrine, you would not give uh, vasopressin. A patient with chronic alcoholism in this question is noted to have the following electrocardiogram in preoperative holding. The most appropriate therapy would be, and you got this weird polymorphic ventricular tachycardia separated by uh, periods of what it looks like 
uh, sinus rhythm. This is torsades de points, and uh, magnesium is one of the treatments for torsades de points. So let's talk about that next. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, multiform instead of uh, 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 monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So up at the top, you can see those multiple forms looking like they're rotating around a flat line, uh, therefore the name, torsades to points. And it occurs in the uh, cases where extreme prolongation of the QT interval is present, R on T occurs, and they go into this, then they go out of it, then they go into it, then they go out of it. So this is a rhythm uh, that this patient in the question, the alcoholic who had uh, hypomagnesemia probably and hypo uh, malnourished and hypophosphatemia, um, all those things together, especially the magnesium, if they were given a drug like an antiemetic, dropiridol, even are on Dancitron, 5-HT3 inhibitors, antidepressants, and there's many other drugs that can prolong the QT interval. But if you give one of those to a patient, it can prolong the QT interval and have a patient go into torsades. Hypomagnesemia is what we should be thinking about along with stopping the drugs that are prolonging the QT interval. If this is unstable and it's not uh, on itself spontaneously coming back to a sinus rhythm and the patient's blood pressure is low, obviously that's an unstable situation. Just defibrillate them. If it's stable and episodic, uh, magnesium treatment is indicated. Uh, and if you can increase the heart rate pharmacologically or in a paced manner, as the heart rate goes up, the QT gets shorter and shorter and that can help things also. Remember the drugs like lidocaine and amiodarone and procainamide, things that we might reach for to treat ventricular tachycardia, can actually worsen torsades. So treatment of torsades, magnesium, defibrillate if they're unstable. Wolf Parkinson White. Um, the WPW patient has an accessory pathway between the atria and the ventricle. And at the top right uh, is a picture, first of all, of a normal patient with SA node uh, originating the electrical activity, conduction through the atria, uh, down to the AV node, there's a delay in the AV node, down to the bundles and up to the heart, as opposed to on the top right, a WPW patient, which not only has their AV node, but also has an accessory pathway shown here. Initially, the signal going uh, antegrade down the heart and then retrograde up through uh, the accessory pathway such that you can get these circus movements and a very rapid uh, ventricular response. The EKG in a WPW patient classically has a short PR interval and an upsloping or delta wave up into the QRS complex shown here on the bottom right. Tachydysrhythmias in WPW patients are common and these tachydysrhythmias include a PAT and atrial fibrillation. If a patient with WPW is hemodynamically unstable, like other patients, you're going to synchronize cardiovert them. Um, if they're stable, things like amiodarone and procainamide, drugs that get at the accessory pathway and not just at the AV node. Normally, if we had atrial fibrillation with RVR, you think of esmolol and diltiazem. And in this case, think amiodarone and procainamide. Uh, and we tend to avoid digitalis and verapamil uh, because they can decrease the refractory period of the accessory pathway and actually increase the ventricular response. So WPW, different if they develop a tachydysrhythmia intraoperatively. Um, uh, esmolol and diltiazem often are contraindicated. Procainamide and amiodarone that get at the accessory pathway itself can be used to treat the tachydysrhythmias. The next uh, topic is cardiac pacemakers and the letters that indicate what type of pacer they are. The three letters, the first one indicates what's paced. If it's um, uh, A, it's atrium. If it's V, it's ventricle. And if it's D, it's both. Then what's sensed. Again, if it's A, it's atrium. V, ventricle. D, it's both. And then what it does in response to sensing and uh, uh, I would be inhibited, D would be dual, T would be triggered. So a DDD pacer would be one that is paced potentially in the atria and the ventricle, there's wires in the atria and the ventricle, sensed in the atria and the ventricle, 
and it could either inhibit or paste depending on what conditions exist. A VOO would be a paste in the ventricle, um, no chamber sensed, no uh, response to whatever the patient's doing. It just merely goes along at whatever it's set at, 60 or 70. And that's classically that VOO mode, what occurs when you put a magnet on the generator of a pacemaker. It converts to that VOO emergent uh, uh, mode. DOO would be paste in the atrium, the ventricle at uh, a set rate independent of the intrinsic heart rate. So it's just merely going along, uh, stimulating the atria, stimulating the ventricle, independent of whatever the patient's doing. So the first three letters are the most important, the um, DDD or VOO as we talked about, but the fourth and fifth letters refer to, in the fourth case, programmability or rate modulation. For example, if a patient's activity goes up, will it increase the heart rate? And then the fifth, has to do with anti-tachydysrhythmia functions. Can it actually pace or shock the patient? Um, but it's the first three, paced, sensed, and response that are the most important. Now, what if I want to put a pulmonary artery catheter in someone who's got these wires, as the picture in the right shows, in the atria and also in the right uh, ventricle? If that pacer has been in for an extended period of time, they fibrose in place, and I don't worry about that pulmonary artery catheter dislodging it. But if it's been in place, the pacemaker, for less than a month, you better think twice about floating a pulmonary artery catheter through it, and you may dislodge uh, the wires. What if I need to shock a patient who's got a cardiac pacemaker? Well, put the dispersion pad uh, and your defib pads as far away from the generator as possible. What if I want to go to an MRI scanner and they have a cardiac pacemaker? It's not an absolute contraindication. In fact, many modern pacemakers and ICDs uh, can be put into an MRI scanner, but you're going to have to follow the guidelines of the maker. There's no evidence that what we give, propofol or volatile anesthetics, alter the stimulation threshold of the pacers to any great extent. But factors that can alter the threshold, uh, the ability to pace, if the patient suddenly got uh, myocardial ischemia, and the wire was sitting right there, the stimulating wire uh, in that muscle that's ischemic, it may not pick up very well. Some indications for pacemakers, absolute, um, uh, sick sinus syndrome, symptomatic sinus bradycardia, complete heart block would be the classic one, prolonged QT syndrome where you wanna speed up the heart rate, keep it fast so that the QT interval is shorter. And then one that is more and more being seen in patients that are coming to the operating room, and that is patients with biventricular pacers. And these are the patients classically with a very low ejection fraction, often like 20%. And what you're trying to do is take these big old hearts that aren't working very well and make sure that you're synchronizing the atria and the ventricle well so that they have the proper rhythm uh, to uh, get the most out of that heart that you can. So that's called resynchronization. And if you look at the graphic on the bottom right, you can see instead of just a wire in the right atrium and the right ventricle, there's also one that's called the left ventricular lead that usually goes through the coronary sinus of the patient and paces the left ventricle. Again, synchronizing the atria and the right and left ventricle so that you get the most cardiac output out of this bad heart. Um, the strong indication for this is a patient who's got sinus rhythm with a wide QRS. They have a bundle branch block already, so asynchrony is occurring between the right and left heart, and they have low left ventricular uh, function, classically an EF less than 35%. That's class A evidence. Wide QRS plus a low ejection fraction, biventricular pacers indicated. Uh, there's less benefit if the QRS is not so wide and they don't have that bundle branch block. So these patients, what do you do with them uh, perioperatively? Well, if they have an ICD in place, um, you probably should think this patient may have a poor ventricle as the cause of their ventricular dysrhythmia, and they may be using that ICD as resynchronization therapy to properly time the atria and the ventricle synchrony to improve cardiac output. So classically, we think about turning off ICDs uh, perioperatively and then turning them back on immediately after surgery with the worry that electrocautery may stimulate the ICD to fire. So if you switched off the ICD preoperatively, uh, 
um, and it was just an ICD, and you monitored that patient and put pads in them so that you could defibrillate them if necessary, that's what many times is done. But if the, it is an ICD with resynchronization pacing by ventricular pacer, and you turned off not only the ICD part, the shock part, but you turn off the pacer part, now the heart's not synchronized as well, and you may have a detrimental effect on cardiac output. So the pacing part should not be turned off in general if you turn off the ICD part. If you have to defibrillate someone with an ICD, just put the uh, defibrillator device as far away as you can from the generator itself. Don't put the paddles right over top of it. The last slide is on transcutaneous pacing. What if a patient suddenly develops severe bradycardia or heart block intraoperatively, doesn't have central access, doesn't have a pacer in place, the chest isn't open, you can't put an epicardial pacer on the heart, can I pace them through the skin? And the answer is you can put these pads on their chest and um, usually anteriorly, posteriorly uh, directed, attach them up, select a heart rate and a current, and turn up the current until their muscles are jumping on their chest and you're capturing a contraction from the heart that can be confirmed with a pulse, SpO2 platysmographic waveform, A-line pulse trace, etc. Now if the patient's awake uh, and you put this on and start shocking them, they're not going to be very happy with you. You're probably going to have to sedate them. Usually it's used short term to stabilize a patient, to keep their heart beating until you can get something else in there like a transvenous pacer or epicardial pacer. But transcutaneous pacing externally via pads can be used in the case of severe bradycardia and complete heart block to keep someone going until you can do someone else, do something else. Remember also that beta-1 agonists can often speed up the heart rate. So giving uh, epinephrine um, uh, would be useful. Now these transcutaneous pacers should not be used for asystole. This is used for bradycardia and complete heart block. It can be synchronized to what the patient's doing, but there's also an option for asynchronous pacing. And the worry being that if you pace the heart at the time that they're contracting, there's worries about a shock occurring on R on T, for example, and creating a, a bad dysrhythmia. And synchronization offers some value. So transcutaneous pacing, Last topic in this uh, talk, this is part two of a three-part series, Cardiac Keyword Review. Uh, here's another quote for you, education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. Pretty dramatic quote, but uh, from John Dewey, hope you keep learning and have a wonderful day.